Welcome, guys. In the room we have today Nerdalian, Agent, and Gram Pong. We are discussing nonviolent communication by Marshall B. Rosenberg. And today is chapter seven, Perceiving Empathically. So in the previous chapters, uh, we uh, learned how to express our observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Uh, in that chapter, we will learn to listen to the other person uh, for their observations, feelings, and needs. And let me just choose my tool. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the slide. Yeah, there it is. <clears throat> That's it. So, empathy. Empathy is uh, listening, emptying our mind and listening with our whole being by Chinese philosopher Chang Tzu. Hmm. Yeah, so basically the gist of the first uh, part of the chapter was explaining um, how in order to listen, we should drop our preconceived notion. Every story is uh, not our exact experience. People, people tell something completely new that we haven't experienced. And in order to completely understand that, we should try to receive it with purity, let's say. Any questions? Questions? Um, I would make some comments. If others have questions, you can ask questions first. No, I was going to say, I don't have any real questions. Rosenberg seems pretty clear on what he's saying. Yeah, so I just think it's it's noteworthy that um, people use terms empathy and sympathy not all the same way. So different people use them in different ways. So in in some circles, empathy refers to mirroring the the feelings of others by feeling the same thing internally, and that's not the way um, Rosenberg is using empathy here. Um, so I just just thought that's that's worth pointing out. It seems from like reading the chapter, what he's mostly interested in, or what he's pointing out when he says empathy is a is an understanding of another person, and understanding um, sort of what he says listening with empathy, um, focusing full attention on trying to understand the entirety of of what a person is experiencing, but not necessarily. Uh, mirroring that experience in ourselves. Uh, it doesn't actually mention mirroring feelings at all. And in fact, in some of the previous chapters, he's, he said that we can't cause each other to feel anything. So, so I'm not sure where he would stand on the, even the possibility of people empathically feeling with others. So this is really interesting because like we use words understanding, which to me sounds almost like a cognitive thing. But it sounds like he's almost talking about like using your whole kind of like um, emotional system to as a sense of perception. So like something arises, you you listen to your whole being. If something arises, you say emotionally realizing that they may not be what they're, they're uh, emitting so much as that's like some sort of form of cognition of you, some sort of form of like, Oh, okay. I when you do that, I feel angry, or I feel upset, or I need to feel it in this part of my body. What does that mean? You know, and that, like using that is another another um, signals is what it kind of reminds me of. I don't know. Maybe I. Yeah, that is a thing that people can do, and Rosenberg doesn't talk about that. So he specifically focuses on the four components of MVC that Kara has there on the slide. So whenever, no matter how people express themselves, try to um, understand what are, what observations are they basing their claims on? Like what are the examples in their heads? Oftentimes that, that'll be implicit. So people make general statements that apply to all humanity while they're thinking about how angry they are at their dad. Um, so trying to read between the lines and listen to uh, like the, 
the things they observe that they're talking about that they're making generalizations about in this case may be their dad and sort of asking questions um, in a sensitive manner to to try to figure out okay what did they observe that they're talking about and how are they feeling about it and how are their feelings related to their specific needs and what it is they may be requesting and i think when he says listening with your whole being if i'm reading him correctly it's something like um turning your entire agenda towards the task of understanding the other person's experience and putting aside any other possible agenda of, of yours so for the moment uh stop just put put aside the stories that you'd like to share or uh, the ways in which you'd like to express your own experiences or uh, pursuing your own goals for a second and just make your focus all of your energy on understanding the other person's experience in a respectful way uh, so that's i think that's what they at, at the end of the chapter that's how they summarize um what they mean by empathy i mean like respectfully trying to understand someone else's experience so I was going to yeah. say, I, um, let me jump in here. One of the things that I pick up here is is the observation aspect, and I throw in there a pre-judgment aspect, and some of that's from my autism, because I focus on that they're having the experience. You know, they're upset, and I'm focusing just on that they're upset and their internal one without relating that to necessarily why they're upset because that because why because brings in some judgment because then i have to assess whether or not you know it's connected to to you know objective reality because people can be upset for all sorts of reasons that aren't necessarily found in the objective world so I see it as I have to set aside anything about the objective world and just focus entirely on their subjective experience and try to understand it from their point of view. And that's sort of where I've adapted that to my, my autistic understanding of the world. Does that resonate with you guys at all? Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, so I think I was obtuse in, in, my, in what I was saying before. So I think what I was talking about was feeling. And so feeling would not solely be originated from your own internal projections, but a feeling could be a result of the experience. And the reason that your feeling could tell you something about the situation, the energy of the, the emotional energy between two people or something. Oh, I agree with you, but I see that as a secondary step. I don't see that as part of the empathy. I see that as more of a problem solving aspect. Well, I, was, and I, was somebody... just, I was just, yeah, I was just I, in my experience, just... I'm just saying from my autistic experience, I found that if I followed that route, I end up being accused of denying their experience and no, denying. I was just, I was just... Okay, so I have a question then. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when Shang Tzu says, um, listen with your whole being, what does he mean by that? Like. That's what exactly what I was trying to describe, where I'm setting my whole being is focused on understanding just their object, just their subjective experience, how they were experiencing what they're trying, their feelings, their experiences, without so, trying to relate that to the rest of the world, just them. It's in isolation. Empty. So, like, through what gates does it come into you? I, I don't know what I don't know what you mean by gates. Well, she said four things. I can't remember what they were. They were thinking, feeling. Uh, okay, so it's observation, feeling, needs, and requests. So uh, we will get into it further, Agent. So let's. It's, sorry, it will yeah. Be just sorry, a little later. Yeah. So some of the some of the later stuff is an interaction where they're requesting, and, and you're there. It's, it's a feedback loop where they're expressing it, and you're saying you're understanding it. And when you do that, that ends up being uh, cathartic for them and healing, is sort yes. of how I understand it. So to just right before we uh, move on, I want to pick up on something Graham said about how a person's subjective experience can be. Uh, divorced from reality, it can be a, an illusory experience. And um, uh, qu qu quick, I'd like to correct you. It's not illusory to them. It's entirely real to them. It just doesn't have a causal connection to the objective world. J just okay. to be a little okay. more precise. Okay. Pedantic, yeah. 
Um, I'm autistic. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I actually quite appreciate that. Um, <laughs> what, what I wanted to say was like, there's, there's a role. I, I'm, I think I'm being uh, in line with what Rosenberg intends to, to communicate. Um, when he says we're trying to understand the other person, he means at like all of the levels at the same time. So what the person is observing in the world and also what the person is feeling about that and also how those feelings and observations relate to their needs and also to the kinds of things they may request of the listener. Now, the thing is the person speaking may not have that understanding to lay it all out clearly to the listener. And so there's, I, I think, and if you look at the examples they give, there's a, a process of shared finding out what are the observations, what are the feelings, what are the needs, what are the requests. So there's a, a teamwork happening where we're both discovering and understanding of the other person's experience. And oftentimes the people saying stuff won't necessarily, before having the conversation, know how they feel about the situation. So they may have feelings about stuff. They may be in pain at a subconscious level about stuff and feel like they need to talk about it but if you ask them hey well, how are you doing they won't be able to say um, i'm feeling sad because this and this happened and i have these and these unmade needs and i would like to ask these and these uh, requests of people they won't be able to just give it to you like that there's a back and forth where people sort of discover the the reality of people's experience and something he wrote about um, leaving the past um, aside and sort of emptying your mind and just taking it, everything is brand new, I think can actually be a little counterproductive because I think if if you're talking to someone you know a little bit or if you repeatedly have conversations with the same person, over time patterns will emerge that'll actually help understand things that happen in future conversations that if you just drop them and forget them, you'll miss out on, on things. Um, that, that'll be like patterns of responding. Oh, the kinds of things that this person gets angry about are these. And you can have a, a couple of examples. I've seen you get angry at, at this. And in the other situation, I've seen you get angry at that. And in another situation, I've seen you get angry. And in the fourth situation, and those things seem to have something in common. And it seems like abstractly, we can generalize these kinds of things tend to get, get to you. Like for me personally, I tend to get quite annoyed at people who um, assert their own authority on what I perceive to be illegitimate bases. So I, I describe that as saying I have a bit of a punkish attitude. So I like, like to rebel against authority I, I see as corrupt or illegitimate. I have a, a, that, that's something that gets to me, gets me angry and sort of notice that through looking at like many examples of things that have gotten me angry. And um, it's just that kind of, a, is one example of something that may be discovered in a conversation, in a nonviolent com conversation. Um, if you do bring your prior knowledge into it. So that's why I, I say, I think the, I don't think it's like empty your mind, focus on your breath and have a perfectly still mind and then kind of sense in your chest the ultimate reality of what's going on in the other person. I don't think that's the kind of thing that Rosenberg means when he says, listen with your, with your whole being. Uh, I think it's like commit yourself fully to the task of understanding. I think that's what that's what he means. I don't know what Sheng Tzu means. Probably something different, but I, I think that's what Rosenberg means. Chuang Tzu, what was the boot's name? Yeah, I. So, uh, so this. Is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, agent. Um, I'm wondering how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> Curious about how you're feeling. I was going to say, I would short, shorthand uh, what uh, Nadalian was saying as uh, Rosenberg doesn't understand uh, iterated game theory. <laughs> uh, that's that's fair comment from an economist to a psychologist. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. OK, so here are the mistakes we can make when uh, trying to receive empathically uh, so we offer our advice or reassurance um, 
too quickly, too fast. We should ask for that. So we, we should ask for permission to do that. And uh, sometimes people are too quick uh, to advise. I think you should <laughs> do that, uh, like without even understanding what the other person is saying. Uh, agent, would you like to read the things like one up in advising? You see that? Uh, sorry, um, you want me to start at number two? Yeah, just like go down. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to ask before offering advice or reassurance. Advising, I think you should. <laughs> One upping. That's nothing. Bear what That's nothing. Oh, that's sorry. Uh, my vision is. Oh. Hold on one second. Here we go. There we go. Uh, advising, I think you should. One upping. That's nothing. Hear what happened to me. <laughs> Educating. This could turn into, oh, educating is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Educating, this could turn into a very positive experience for you if <laughs> consoling. It wasn't your fault. You did the best you could. So the, ask advice. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to read these out and then I have a question. Storytelling. That reminds me of the time. Shutting down. Cheer up. Don't feel so bad. Sympathizing. Oh, you poor thing interrogating when did this begin explaining i would have called but correcting that's not how it happened oh that's an interesting one as well so yeah. so these are things that you want to ask before you do like these are oh, all examples these are the of things you should not do <laughs> oh really that's quite like like if you have permission you do them or you just don't do these oh that's interesting so if you'll she'll obviously go into alternatives later right no, it's like it's to build up on uh, receiving empathically. Uh, so in order to receive empathically, we should not jump in. That's what he meant by emptying our minds to receive. So we should like drop all of that and just listen to the other person. And we listen precisely for the four things, which is like we are trying in our mind identify observations feelings needs and requests oh, oh, we're listening only for those four things and so mm -hmm. no please continue i'm sorry i do that no no it's, it's okay like i just like those are the things you should not do so first you so this is the chapter and you receive an empath empathetically and, and like i don't know the material but i'm assuming later on he will go on when you can do certain strategies that are helpful or not help helpful right so right now we're talking about it emphatically. So we're talking in relation to Shang Tzu, who talks about receiving in orientation to the four things that were aforementioned before. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I, I, I have a question at this point because I don't understand what's wrong with sympathizing. Oh, you poor thing, especially considering there's usually some sort of communication loop going on where the person doesn't want to sit there and just basically info dump at you endlessly without you giving some sort of feedback that you're following along and tracking with them. And I don't see where things like, you know, all the other ones I can see being inappropriate at times, but some sort of kickback that, that you're following them at least on an emotional level and all. I don't see why that should be flagged as wrong. What do you guys think? So personally, I, I don't think... Uh, any of those things are absolutely wrong all of the time. Um, Rosenberg does um, sort of present a form of communication, he calls nonviolent communication, that is made up of two parts. The one part is expressing oneself honestly through the four comp components, so expressing observations separated from evaluations, so clear, concise observations. Uh, expressing feelings in a way that are truly this is actually how I feel and not I feel like you're being a jerk kind of vibe um, and then linking the observations into um, observations and feelings to needs and then making clear and specific requests and so expressing ourselves in that way um, our own needs and our own observations and our own feelings honestly and then the second part is receiving that from others empathically and in this chapter he describes what he means by empathically so he's he's basically presenting a form of communication that's entirely um, contained in that sort of space so that all of the communication happens i'm either um, sharing something i observed or i'm sharing something i feel or i'm showing 
a need I have, or I'm making a request of, of another person, or I'm listening to you share an observation, or I'm listening to you share a feeling, or I'm listening to you sh share a need, or I'm listening to you make a request. And what he was proposing is that kind of communication um, leads people to have more uh, compassionate conversations. And so he's basic, and also he, he thinks that should be uh, the gold standard or the, the, um, the goal for all communication, which I think doesn't make entire sense if you think of all the different ways and contexts in which people communicate. So for example, a really fun way to communicate is playful banter, which would break all of the rules and is not necessarily an unhealthy thing to do. That can be a very wholesome, fun way for people to spend their time together to um, playfully insult each other in a way where people understand we're playing a game and everybody's is good and on, on board with that. Um, and the fact that that's not particularly compassionate, it's playful, I don't think makes it less valuable than a compassionate thing. So, where, so where does it go against that? Which would be an example of that one out of the list? So, well, you could sarcastically interrogate people or you could make give sarcastic advice. Like if, you, if, you're gonna, if it's going to be banter, you could do all those things in a sarcastic way to put people down, to make them look stupid and make them appear inferior. Well, it is a judgment call, though, uh, Nardalian. Like sometimes when people share distress, uh, banter would be inappropriate. Like everything is according to situation. So I can, um, let's say, Graham, uh, for example, empathizing, like uh, I feel you, I understand you, you, yeah, you, like that sucks, that's your poor thing. Uh, sometimes it's inappropriate. As so, well, like the, I, I can see that situation where the person is expressing something that that is just like so emotional. It, it's just like the only thing could be received that I'm hearing you, and that's it. Empathizing um, might seem um, you like people subconsciously don't like. I, for example, I'm not always expecting others to understand me. Sometimes I want to be heard just and when a person says without understanding me and i clearly can see they do not know what i'm going through and they're like oh i empathize you poor things i was like i feel angry because like no you it's don't not, yeah it sounds condescending almost right like you poor thing it kind of belittles the the because they, they don't understand what you're feeling and then they're so how can yeah yeah but i, I guess i guess the one thing i think where some of these criticisms that i'm hearing coming from are going from a higher level like this is within the context of nonviolent communication there's obviously other forms of communication so playful banter would not fall under the umbrella of nonviolent communication so therefore it'd be on a different frame good point like, it's no no you brought up a good point Kara. Th thank you for mentioning that about sometimes it's just the only thing you can do is just sit and listen and say i'm still listening I'm, I'm thinking um, about appropriate uh, moment of consoling. It was not your fault. You did the best you could. I think only after the situation is inviting it, after you listened long enough, you kind of already get subconscious message somehow, or like usually when the situation slows down, when the story it's like that that monologue, let's say, of what is going on inside me is, is like slowed. And then I'm sitting down and awaiting quietly for the response. I think that might invite, but still appropriate to the situation. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think Rosenberg would um, say that like it, more or less anything on them, maybe except for advising, can be done um, around the the four components. So, like, whatever the goal was for any of those things can be achieved um, by communicating the, the four components honestly and receiving them empathically and um, doing the paraphrase thing. So, I think he'd want to like replace all of those. Uh, yeah, I think so. 
they do later in the chapter say that it's important to leave enough space and sustain the empathy for long enough so people can get deep, deeper into their experience. Like there's usually much more to an experience than people uh, share just right off the bat. And so asking for clarification and um, doing the, the paraphrasing thing can help them elaborate a much richer picture of their experience. And so, yeah, they like if you were going to consult it would make more sense once you have a, a bigger picture. But I, th I think Rosenberg means you shouldn't console. I was going to say one of the things that I was going to mention there is some of the items on that list are much more talking down at somebody from a superior standpoint. It's the I know what you should do. I had this is basically you're their superior as opposed to their equal. Some of them, it's like when you tell a story that's what you, happened to you in a similar situation, that's more a peer-to-peer -peer where they can extract from your story what's relevant for them as opposed to you telling them what they need to learn. You know, and, and that's something that I see is different. I see a peer-to-peer -peer is, is, is if you slide into that superiority role without them asking for that advice, you've horribly overstepped a boundary. What do you guys think? So I, I totally agree with that, Grant, uh, Graham. Sorry. Uh, and the thing that I wonder about is, uh, yeah, what is so? I guess, it, I guess it's a matter of being invited or finding the pause to be able to to do that. Is that the problem with that one? Is that where the error lies in the sharing your thing? From my experience, it comes more from the person's internal, their own relationship to the world. Do they see themselves as basically working with the world or trying to impose their will on the world? Because the ones who go more with the will on the world are going to see that they need to impose their will onto you. And the problem is that you're not being like how they are. And at the, as soon as you get more like them, your problems will stop. <laughs> I think a, a simple statement of um, what Rosenberg says is wrong with all those things is whenever you're doing any of those things, what you're not doing is um, getting a better understanding of the other person's experience. So there's, there are things that you could do that do not amount to uh, receiving the other person's experience empathically. And what Rosenberg means by empathically is with understanding. So if you're consulting someone that's not, like while you're consulting them, you're essentially trying to man manipulate them into feeling better, but manipulate sounds a bit bad. So maybe influence them into feeling better. And people can have different opinions about whether influencing someone to feel better is good or bad, but what it's not, it's not trying to understand them. I would say, unless they've asked you to help them feel better at that point delivering what they've asked for now we're further on into rosenberg's chapter where you've communicated a need and they're helping you just wanted to point out that aspect yeah good point okay i, I sent the email nahama appeared in um, in in the comments i sent her an email to join hopefully she will join and also Cordell is in the room. Hi, everybody in the live chat. Hello, guys. So um, I guess I, I changed the slide without asking <laughs> in a way. Um, but it, it kind of continues the same uh, kind of idea. Um, so instead of doing all of those things in the previous slide, uh, sometimes we need to indi indicate that we understood or trying to understand the other person better and the way to do it of course is not interrogation uh, it's just like would be what i did what did i do to do for you to feel like that so no do not to interrogate but um rather paraphrasing um with understanding somehow um, are you reacting to how many evenings i was gone last week like you kind of trying to to narrow down the story so 
so you, you you repeating it to the other person and again through all of that you are trying to identify uh, what you are uh, absorbing feeling or like what the other person is absorbing feeling needing and requesting but through paraphrasing so guys who wants to read the paraphrasing graham <laughs> Sure, I'll go. Just leave, leave that up there so I can read it. Mm -hmm. um, A. What others are observing. Are you reacting to how many evenings I was gone last week? B. How others are feeling and the needs generating their feelings. Are you feeling hurt because you would have liked more appreciation for your efforts that you than you received? C. What are others requesting? Are you wanting me to tell you my reasons for saying what I did? So are these things we're supposed to do or are these other errors? Well, those are the things we should do instead of errors. Oh, okay. And uh, so basically, again, it's, it's like this paraphrasing is this... So instead of doing those errors, we're doing that. Uh, like when the moment again invites for this pause. Uh, so this feedback that Graham talked about, like when do we need to know that the other person is uh, understanding or hearing us somehow like that, that, that is how I understand it. Mm. Also in the room is Tito, hi Tito. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like be below that, uh, which is like, is a kind of the same questions, but uh, asked in an in interrogative way, which is, uh... Agent, you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find it in the book so I can follow along and get an overview. Yeah. Sorry. What chapter is it? Seven. Seven. Okay. Yeah, just to give me like so if I, I'm I'm not I apologize for not giving you my full attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but the reason she asked was your um, video stream got technically colored funky for a little while. Oh my god, that's exactly the word was in my head. <laughs> like <laughs> the funky thing. <laughs> that sounds like a great name for a club band or something. Technicolor funky. <laughs> <laughs> Technically funky. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. That sounds like my socks, actually. <laughs> okay. Mm. Oh, that would smell funky. Yeah. Um, so, so anyways, yeah, I guess this isn't going to work, but I'll just pay attention, I guess. It's okay. Don't, don't worry. Like, so, so basically, the, the short form, I, I did the conspect on a book here. Yeah. yeah no, it's just because I got disturbed because I kind of got distracted by the fact that, like, I was like, okay, you had... The, number, the other one had two, and that was, like, not according to, yeah, so anyway, so it was just the organization that kind of confused me, that's all. Okay, um, so, is that pretty clear, or do, do you guys want to discuss it a little bit more? Um, maybe a comment that's worth making. Um... Like Rosenberg does advise to be very careful with the tone in which um, people paraphrase things. I don't know if this is in a next slide. If you talk about sort of some of the hazards that come along with paraphrasing, like people may react defensively, and it's like really easy to accidentally sound a little condescending or a little sarcastic and stuff. And when someone's expressing very vulnerable and intense emotions. Um, being sort of sarcastically reflected back can be very hurtful. So the, the easiest way to get the tone right is not necessarily maybe to focus on singing it in the right intonation, but to uh, check in with oneself that one's in, intention with the paraphrasing is not to do the process right or to perform NVC or whatever, but that one's purpose is to, to understand what the other person is experiencing. And so like when one paraphrases to that, that there are two sincere purposes that are at play. The one is to check understanding. Like, do I understand correctly? You are feeling sad about this. And the other one is to 
to show that, that you've understood what they're experiencing. They could do those at the same time by, um, by checking understanding. And yeah, so as long as it's with, with the humility that one is sincerely inquiring, I, I think, can be, can, will you please help me make sure that I'm following along here? Uh, people usually react all right to that. Say, I say usually, in my experience at least. Well, that whole chapter is new to me. So I, I, I never tried to go through that fo formula while listening. Um, I usually make mistakes of jumping in with the advice or a story or one-upping. One-upping is the thing <laughs> that I'm guilty of. <laughs> you think you had it rough. I had it rougher. <laughs> and then we go into that. <laughs> that kind of banter it's like I, I i think like that thing like one up in sounds humorous and it's very inappropriate but it is kind of what about uh seven up in oh how is that <laughs> it's like seven times up in <laughs> It's like it's so beyond like you crush the, the other person feeling like absolutely horrible but then you're like you think that's the problem? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it's like uh, the other person feel, feels even shit. <laughs> 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 mm. I was going to say storytelling is my big sin on that one. I, uh, you know, I'll sit there and I'll try to, you know, especially if somebody's feeling bad, I'll try to distract them with the story of, you know, one of the times that I was felt bad in a similar situation and such. Yeah. That just... That's what I do. <laughs> Apparently it's wrong. I don't try to one up and say how much worse mine was. I just sort of say, hey, I had a bad one too. Yeah, it feels like it's coming from place of understanding, like uh, being there as well. So I know what you're talking. I kind of, I, I have the capacity to understand what you're going through. Maybe not exactly. Yeah, think, so like, yeah, that's interesting too, Graham, because when you bring that up, um, I'm like, um, so paraphrasing versus, yeah, because sometimes I think that storytelling is a form of empathizing. But maybe so maybe there's a subtle degree of discernment or distinction between the two. Could be. I'm just sharing the stuff that I find that works for me and you know, my sins. <laughs> what do you think, uh Mr. Plebs? Plebsy. Um actually quite like a plebsy is the name. I use it for one of my video game characters. Anyway, I I think storytelling can be powerful. I'm trying to Im imagine how Rosenberg might respond to that kind of question. I'm not sure. I, I just, just beyond saying the real risk there is to um, listen partially and jump in with a story that is completely irrelevant because you haven't understood what the person is experiencing before you start. That must be in really irritating. Yeah. So a person might be sharing an experience. And then bef before having a chance to to lay out the experience, they get interrupted and get the opportunity to listen to the other person's story instead of sharing the experience. Hey, Nakama is back. <laughs> Hi, I am here. Hi. I'm going to do more listening than talking today. I have a cold, so my throat oh. and lungs are there. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. Uh, so, guys, there are only two more slides left. We are almost done through the chapter, by the way. It's like, so we can just hang out later. Oh, cool. Ah, okay, so you guys content with that one? I can try to move on. Uh, okay, let's upload another slide. That one. Okay. So here is the times when um, it's um, it's uh, when we are trying to precise um, something from the other person very carefully 
uh, also when we are paraphrasing, if the situation is very emotionally charged or, or um, the other person might uh, not trust what we are trying to say, it's like in order to break the ice, uh, we can start by, let's say, first expressing what we feel in relation to what we just heard the other person told us. So let's say it was a story that they tell us. And we are, instead of going into storytelling, and after we paraphrased maybe a little bit, if we understood it correctly, or before paraphrasing, depends how the situation demands it, we can express what we feeling or needing. Like, uh, I need a glass of water. Wow. Like, for example, that, after hearing that story. If you want to go with the funny one. <laughs> so there is the funny response. Um, I, mean, I need a pork chop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so here is, uh, I remember Marshall B. Rosenberg uh, talked about uh, a nurse that is sitting in the, uh, in the like whatever in a hospital somewhere and she's like i want to die and like uh, a passerby other nurse was like did you just say you want to die and then they like started talking so here so the other nurse paraphrased it whatever was over there and they started talking but like that's really really a specific situation usually it is very inappropriate like i i really don't understand like this is just some of example how we can react when the situation is like emotionally charged yeah so any comments on that one i noticed that when like if i hear something that's so shocking and I don't even know what to say. What I started to do is I just say, oh my God, I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> like, that's my response. Like, that's what I'll verbalize. Before I was like, I need to find something to say. But now, like, that's my expressing my feelings at, at hearing that thing. And then usually it's like, if it's something very shocking, the other person is like, yeah, you know. So would it be so autistic? Like, to... Sorry. No, go ahead, Agent. So would it be autistic to find that completely ironic? No, I think it'd be very human to find that ironic. <laughs> <laughs> Autistic or not. <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think Rosenberg does um, do a, a decent job at, at saying like, it's not always appropriate to go around paraphrasing people's feelings back at them, especially their, their feelings. It can be a sensitive in context where the cultural norm is feelings stay outside the door. We're doing official business here. And like we don't discuss feelings. It can be uh, perceived as disrespectful to reflect an angry person in the meetings, anger uh, explicitly back at them. Like it appears that you're angry. Is that correct? May maybe taken as an insult and just go down very poorly. Um, and it, 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 se several situations. So one of the points there on the on the board is to paraphrase only when it will contribute to understanding and compassion and in, par in parentheses and not when it would be socially highly inappropriate to par paraphrase. So what you're saying is... Sorry. <laughs> it's not to say the straw manning. It's like, it's like straw manning and steel manning. Is it paraphrase? <laughs> I was going to add my observation here. Some of that is map and territory, where anytime you're paraphrasing, you're shortening and condensing what they said. So you're going to be inherently leaving out parts. And you lose Graham. Do that. Now you've now you've stepped and done harm. Tag. We missed that last sentence, Graham. Oh, I said if you over if you overstep, mm -hmm. and you sit there and you leave out the stuff that they were trying to express that was crucial, that's when you've made a, an error in trying to empathize and understand them, and you've done harm to them. 
that makes sense? Yeah. That, that does make sense. Just just on a technical point, um, both straw manning and steel manning are uh, applications of paraphrasing, but the, the terms come from debate contexts where people are trying to discover truth about some, something like objective reality. So which one would that be? So that, let's say uh, two sociologists are debating about um, the truth of this or other theory of the formation of nation states. Um, so, and then they're criticizing each other's theories. So one method of criticizing is to restate the, um, the opponent in the debate's position in a way that gets it slightly wrong and makes them slightly weaker and easier to criticize. That would be straw manning. Uh, steel manning would be doing the same thing, but making their position stronger than they claim. So rephrasing slightly differently, but make their position stronger. Um, I think neither of those are particularly relevant in the context of compassionately sharing feelings in a vulnerable way. Because um, I guess I guess that there is a bit of a question about like the appropriateness of feelings, but that becomes a values question. Observations can be inc incorrect, but Rosenberg says correcting incorrect observations blocks empathetic um, responses. Something I'd uh, like to one bring thing up later. This, this it just feels important to say, and it's tangent. Like it's a tangent, no matter where I say it in the chapter. But he at no point in this chapter addresses how to deal empathically with someone who's being deceptive or communicating in bad faith. Um, you're hitting on something really, really important from my perspective here, and that's the difference between cooperative communication and competitive communication. Because you just mentioned about debates with steel manning and straw manning, and earlier on, when we were talking about games and such, what, what had popped into my head was games like poker, where you don't want to share your goals, your agenda, and all that. That's inherently cooked into the um, situation. Also, negotiations in business. You don't want to lay your cards out on the table. So I sit here and see is like, from my perspective, I have to look at Rosenberg's nonviolent communication as existing within like a safe space bubble where it's already designated that this is what we're trying to go for here. And there are situations that I have to sign off on. It's just, it's just not going to work there. What do you guys think? Tag. Yeah, I agree. It's like um i'm still thinking about number two reflect back messages that are emotionally charged yeah something like that is it to is it to see if you're accurate in your understanding or is that to express the empathy to the other person I guess when it's really clear how they're, where they're feeling, it would be insincere to pretend to be asking for clarification. Like if it's very, if someone's crying, so right. very obvious they're, they're sad, to then reflect back to that, I see you feeling very sad about this. It would be a little pretentious to to pretend like, I'm, I, I, am I correct that you're feeling sad, crying person? <laughs> yeah. It's like the answer would be, <laughs> no, your eyes deceive you. <laughs> These are raindrops. These aren't tears. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still thinking about humor. Um, I remember it's like I was like describing a difficult situation I'm in, like really like the whole step by step, the complex situation and uh, to Nerdalian and then Nerdalian para, like shortened this, condensed the situation to just two sentences, but it was so funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the entire uh, charge of the situation was dropped. This is not describe the situation right here in Nerdalian. I just like saying it is possible um, to kind of reflect back on a situation and sometimes with understanding like, nice but sometimes if you reflect back but with slight humor you can mm. not only show understanding but you kind of provide healing but again everything is 
according to the appropriateness of the situation. Like it's always I, I, I want I want to I want to sign in here and sign off 100 percent on that, Kara. That is something that I call um, that's catharsis. I refer to oh, it that as, as spiritual alchemy. And that was taught to me when I was a teenager by a concentration camp survivor from the Holocaust. And they sat there and it was when I was helping a classmate, um, you know, some of my classmates study for their bar, bar mitzvahs. And he sat there and he was um, pointing at his uh, number tattoo, telling anti-Semitic Holocaust jokes at the same time. And it was so horrific and hilarious. It was like, it was an experience that it has, I've taken that through my life and it saved me. I don't know how many times being able to take horrific situations and trying to find a, that seed of humor to survive. I'm gonna tag to you guys, just wanted to share that story. Um, I mean, I also kind of learned that as a child, like sometimes, uh, when you have a bunch of kids like uh, come into your house like a shelter because something bad is going on and and uh, you kind of uh, I usually <laughs> take it upon myself you know, attention seeker to entertain the crowd uh, mm. and and finding something funny in the difficult situation I could see the transformation. Uh, in their faces and like this diff like whoosh, like it's gone mm. and and like the, sometimes there was the, those jokes which are called too soon and sometimes mm. they're not soon enough yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but when delivered right just right their magic yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I think I lost that ability I want to train it back mm. <laughs> But like when it happens, it's uh, it feels like magic. Yeah. Uh, so guys, I have one last slide, and it's uh, basically uh, almost uh, a summary. The, uh, to me, all of it, um, it's a judgment call. It's already you. If you both decided that the communication will be non-violent, oh mm -hmm. my God, it's closed. Okay, doesn't matter. If you both decide that communication is non-violent, uh, you kind of try and stay within this frame or formula, but still everything can be changed. Like it's a guideline. You can, you can kind of navigate in between those or like use just some of those principles. So Nerdalian, would you like to explain the number seven? Just to, to read it from seven till B. From seven to B. All right. Sustaining empathy. Sustaining empathy. Don't proceed too quickly. The speaker has received adequate empathy when we sense a release of tension or the flow of words comes to a halt. So yeah, I think we have talked a little bit about this already today. Um, but to un un really understand a person's experience can take some time. Mm. And they may actually struggle to find the words to describe their experience. And so the first words they share are just the opening of a, of a joint exploration and using things like paraphrasing and um, in, a, in a questioning manner, asking if, if understood correctly and asking for clarification and, and staying with the task of fully being present with the person and fully trying to understand the person's experience until they've been understood can take a while. Some conversations take take hours really to to unpack, and like if it's depending on how traumatic it is, it could take multiple hour sessions over multiple weeks or months uh, to really un unpack it. And so the I think Rosenberg kept saying is that if if it's a if it's a smallish thing, then sometimes having a, a brief conversation, maybe five minutes, maybe thirty minutes, a conversation can release whatever emotional tension was held before the conversation. And so sometimes it's it's visible, um, like Kara said, where the tension, you can see the tension drop out of a person. And sometimes that visual um, clue can be used as an indication that the, the thing that needed to be understood has been understood. Mm. And sometimes 
the, the flow of word stopping is something that for me, I think can be a, a bit misleading because when someone is trying to share something where they don't know the words to express it and they need time to try to find the words, they may stop talking because they don't have the words yet. And the, the gears are still turning. The eyes are still going, tr trying to find words to, to, to communicate to the person in front of them. If at that point they're interrupted, I think that's still too soon, even if they have been quiet for five minutes at that point. Uh, but I don't think just the word stopping is necessarily a, a clear sign that they've, what needed to be understood has been understood. I don't think this time is again like that whole chapter was new information. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I did not do any of those never and uh, I, I did hear a lot of times I'm a bad listener <laughs> <laughs> and like uh, jumping into quick uh, jumping in with one up story <laughs> or something or like trying to um, that that's that's definitely a wrong pattern and yeah, uh, I've definitely done that. that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I feel like jumping in too quick. Like I, I can think of a few times where I was so eager to understand somebody. They would say a few sentences, and I would jump in. Oh, you mean this? This is, and they're like, No, no, no. I mean, and I was like so eager to be empathetic and understanding that I was jumping the gun and not really listening. Like I, I wanted to be right in my listening so much that I wasn't listening. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Actually I have to shut up <laughs> and listen more. But it always comes from a good place. It's like, <laughs> <my thoughts>. yes. <laughs> no, it I'm comes guilty. from a good place, but then it's like, okay, well, if it's not effective, then I gotta switch it up. But yeah, yeah, no, I'm really guilty of that a lot uh, myself in the comma is uh, I'll sit there and I'll think I'll understand what they're saying and I'll want to be so excited and I want to get further on in the conversation and talk about stuff downstream and I'll just totally jump ahead and totally miss where they're at. And now I'm totally guilty. That, that's one bad one of mine. Okay. Hey. me, Graham. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Asian, do you have some questions, guys? Yeah, can you summarize all the bullet points, the numbers? Okay. Uh, <laughs> all of them, I have to open them up. So the one thing is like one through seven are, are all kind of like examples of... Okay. So uh, the... Uh, even if just the even just what the numbers are, right? Yeah. So there's the sustaining empathy. So first is empathy. Um, it's like when we empty our kind of minds and just listen with our all being. Number two, uh, we wait for kind of permission or where the room invites it to uh. give our reassurance or advice or which is number three, paraphrasing. So paraphrasing is like, it's actually the most inviting way to uh, respond, uh, like according to the book. And number four, mm, we actually uh, asking uh, when we already paraphrasing and sometimes we have to decide between four, five and six, which is like either we express our feelings or uh, we repeat back exactly what people said, or we paraphrase it uh, uh, like accordingly, according to whatever situation is inviting. So there are three ways we could uh, respond, but basically paraphrasing. Uh, it's like that's that's the biggest advice. So listening and then paraphrasing. And the last one would be, uh, it's, uh, we uh, still keep listening, even after we paraphrase, we find ways to sustain that empathy. 
and we give empathy to ourselves and uh, like sometimes we need to repeat to ourselves like we have to absorb how we feel in response to what we just heard uh, what we absorb what we need and uh, kind of internalize all of that as well and if we feel um like the situation is charging us up or we need to uh, what, like stop, <laughs> breathe and give ourselves some empathy or which is like here is hidden, but uh, we can, uh, if we feel overwhelmed, we scream non-violently, which I still don't understand how we can scream non-violently. Every scream seems violent. Mm -hmm. Or we take time out, which is like, I, I need a breather. So we kind of rush out of the room and we come down. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, it seems passive aggressive when we run out of the room, but sometimes it's the only thing we can do. I think it was used by passive aggressive people. But like, uh, if it's honestly, uh, I, I do have sometimes like, if I, if I will not Come, if I will not end the conversation right now, I might sense, say something too much and I will mm -hmm. regret it. Actually, so I just decided, actually, yeah. I have an example of that last one. There's a there's a time where I was moving and I got into a conflict with my mother. And I said, you know what? I'm not having this conversation right now. I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to calm down. And then when I come back, I don't want to deal with this because I can't deal with this today. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like if I'm really charged and I'm not in a good space to be having a conversation, I'll literally just say that to the person and say, look, I don't think we should do this now because you deserve to have me at like a level head. And I want to be able to give you that. So let me take, I'll take my, yeah, that's much better. That. That's much better. Less better. Yeah. Cause then it's like the, we goal. It's not just like, Oh, you're so annoying me that I can't deal with you now. It's like, no, I want to do this properly. Give me a couple minutes. Let me go for a walk. Let's talk tomorrow. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes, no one, no one. Go ahead. Something in response to the, the previous slide that was um, about reflecting intense emotions. That can be quite powerful if we ourselves can stay level headed. Because intense emotions make it difficult for anyone to think clearly, to think rationally, and to stay close to the facts and to think in a way that's, that's reasonable. Um, and like, if you're listening to someone who gets intensely emotional about something, reflecting that emotion back to them can help them regain contact with re reality and reasonableness. So if they're really, really angry at something, they may not be aware of the reality that I am experiencing anger right mm. now. They, they may be com completely consumed by that bastard how dare he like he didn't know right and what so like completely in that story and, and reflecting back to them i see you're feeling very angry at this person can help bring them in the moment which a, a true moment like yes like the I, like my chest is burning my face is red and stuff like I, i'm experiencing anger and i think most adults guess that if they're that angry like oh maybe the things i'm thinking right now aren't the most reasonable things and so um maybe at that point coming down or whatever but like oftentimes um just reflecting on the emotion itself will actually reduce the the level of the anger because as soon as a, as an angry person pays attention to oh i'm feeling anger right now what they're not thinking is that bastard how dare he and so the, the thought that bastard how dare he is an angry thought but the feeling i'm experiencing anger right now and it hurts is a more compassionate thought um, so the yeah the, the changing the, the observation to what I'm experiencing right now can, especially for anger, help. I'm not so sure for sadness it helps. Like at times when I think, oh, I'm sad right now, it's actually made me feel more sad. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you hit on some stuff there that's uh, relevant to what I was saying. And it's the, I recognize with my autism and some of my explorations on it that um, I actually get pain from people trying to tell me things that aren't objectively true. It's like their words don't match that one. And the classic one for that was me was, was when I was in first grade, I had a, a, a my, my teacher, again, it's when you all have the teacher for all the classes. 
she kept telling me I didn't understand math because I was arguing whether the five apples were not the same as five oranges. They were only the same in number and different in price, taste, you know, texture, all that one. And again, I had done all sorts of math. Well, you know, I, I, my mother had taught me stuff well beyond that before I was ever, you know, started school. And the teacher kept saying, I just didn't understand math. And finally had to have, I was getting fights in the playground, had to have a conference with the teacher, with my parents. My mother sat there and said, no, my son understands math. You just don't understand how to teach my son. And they pulled me out of that class. Tag. Well said. Your mother's a wise woman. She Sounds was. Like yeah. Ah. <sighs> I was thinking um, about paraphrasing part, mm. which is my favorite uh, in that whole chapter. And if situation allows it, uh, how to paraphrase it with humor? Because like, uh, it, it, is, um, it is having that effect, um, hopefully, uh, on people that would like uh, make them assess the situation from different perspective, uh, kind of lighter. I, I know sometimes situation doesn't uh, require that, but situational assessment is something that stops my anger, let's say. Like when I step out of my myself, like, I mean, I don't know what, what I'm feeling. I'm just like, and then I'm describing, uh, uh, my heart is palpitating, like I, I feel like slight, uh, slight choking kind of sensation in my neck. I'm trying to say something, but, but I can't. I am out of breath. Am I combative? Am I angry? And then I was like, okay, if I'm angry, I'm like deconstructing it a little bit. So if you did that and someone mm -hmm. said, oh, it appears you're circle drinking right now, would that be nonviolent <laughs> communication? Uh, what is circle jerking? Yeah. <laughs> I just don't know what it means. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one to describe it. <laughs> so, so Cara, sometimes when a whole circle of people like each other very much. <laughs> Ew. Very adult play. <laughs> what, what is it like? like circle but, but jerking? It's used, it's used colloquially as if like we're all massaging each other's egos in a non-sexual sense, although it is a sexual term. Mm. But it's it's like, oh, we're just saying this to make each other feel better or whatever. Yeah, it, I think, yeah. Oh. Like when everyone's just agreeing with each other or whatever, yeah. Ooh. Mm. And so in that, oh, oh I, should, I shouldn't say what I was about to say. In that <laughs> colloquial sense of like the, the conversation being aimed at making each people feel better about themselves. There are some, some practices that I'd rather not mention out loud now that forbid people to explicitly disagree with each other and compel people to explicitly ex ex express appreciation for each other. And that is a little circle jerky. That flew over my head. Are we talking about cults? What are we talking about? <laughs> It sounds like it when I describe it, doesn't it? Yeah. Just, yeah. But, um, Just write it in the chat. <laughs> 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 I, I, are you talking about dialogos? I'm talking about dialogos, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Can you, can you, pardon me, I gapped out for a second. Yeah, so, so part of the, the rules of dialogue is, is that people are not allowed to explicitly disagree with each other or explicitly criticize each other. And they are compelled to show appreciation for what each other says. So you listen to someone and oh. then you have to appreciate something they said. Really? Compelled, yeah. Is... At least the version, the version I practiced, yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't realize so dialogue was... Goes... Mm -hmm. Sorry, Agent. No, that was Graham. Oh. oh, I was going to I was going to ask. So what you're saying, if I go up and sit there and say, you need to trade me your five dollar bill for my four ones, you don't get to disagree. So the, the conversations aren't negotiated.
negotiations and so people okay. won't be making won't be making demands of each other now they're having an intellectual conversation okay so, well, i was just curious about factual if you if you're allowed to disagree based off a of fact and so the, the conversations are philosophical the conceptual analysis um so with conceptual analysis so, so it's maybe a little less culty than it sounds if i just don't give that context that it's um, people describing their understanding of philosophical terms like justice. Mm. Um, which, I mean, that can get into the territory of, like, of people. Once you get to truth, you're kind of being self-reflexive and <laughs> objective reality. I, again, I can see some problematic uh, singularities that can crop up there. Yeah, I, I honest, didn't, honestly, I, I, I didn't think the conversations were fruitful enough to continue doing them. Oh, that's a shame. Hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it, I didn't realize dialogos had like a formal format. I thought it was just sort of an informal word that people use for like conversations that where you come to some understanding of the other person or you have some like an energetic flow. Yeah, but I didn't realize that there were places where that has a formal format. That makes sense. Actually, that's something that John Vavaki moaned about is the formal format version of it is called dialectic into dialogos, which is a practice he designed to help people have dialogos. Mm. I guess the, the abstract definition of dialogos is when people jointly um, reach insights that none of them could reach on their own. Mm which happens in almost yeah. any good conversation. So. Which is which is funny because at times there were times when people just wouldn't play, right? It was interesting. Oh, how did that how did that manifest? I'm curious. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that to be honest. Hmm. Sh shall we practice nonviolent communication? Yeah. If we're fighting. What, what, <laughs> what what observation did you have in mind as an example? Who, who me? Yeah, uh, I can see it in my mind, but I can't quite articulate it at the moment. Can That's I try? Oh. <laughs> so there, there are people trying to uh, analyze something and to reach this common understanding of of that one, let's say sentence, and of course they have to. Uh, talk with respect to, to each other and they are not allowed to disagree with each other I think like if, if I understand dialogues correctly they are not allowed to do that they have to be always polite but then there are like two people who understand it completely different and then they are like passively aggressive throwing at each other until the the fight gets heated so much that everybody is just fighting that's how I imagine it they're getting mad because they can't say what they really think. <laughs> yes, because they have to be polite. Yeah, I... I was going to say that... Go, I was going to say, go ahead. Sorry, Graham. Um, I'm not doing this dialogue very well. I keep interrupting. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, no, no, you're great. I What I was going to share is I was taught as a kid, and this, again, maybe it helps with my autism, and this is just what I abstracted, but my father explained that if there's a if people disagree on something, you can drill down deep enough until you either come to where one of you went right and one of you went left on an opinion, or one of you is mistaken about a fact. And again, you may be that neither of you are wrong, it's just an opinion, or it may be that one of you are wrong, but eventually if you drill down deep enough, one of those, two, you're gonna hit one of those two things. And sort of my, my approach that I've taken, and clearly that's going to run counter that dialogous approach, and I'm going to get all sorts of toes stepped on. That explains a lot of where I've gone wrong interacting with some people. I'm just operating from a different role set. Hmm. Tag to you guys to see what you think and any feedback you have, have to help me improve on getting along with people. I had such a different conception of dialogues. Oh, well, um... Like the way I was looking at it is like, let's say there's eight people in a room and then we've each got our unique perspective and each perspective is like a color in this like little pie and we each add our different color. And then it just, you know, then we get this kaleidoscope that we didn't have before. 
So to me, it's not yeah. about right or wrong because my perspective is mine. Yours is yours. I might learn something from yours. You might learn from mine. So I think when it works, it, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Verveke's fired. <laughs> I don't like his definition of <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That, that doesn't make sense to me that you can't have a different opinion than somebody else. Like that's going to happen. I'm a human. Like, I'm not going to, like, I guarantee you there's at least a bunch of things that all of us here have different opinions on. They're like, there's no problem with that in my book. Okay. I see we all participate in the same objective reality and we're all abstracting our own point of view from that basic objective reality. And it's our point of view then adds to that reality. And when we're interacting, we're sharing that one and contributing and building something that we're adding to reality. And it's basically this feedback flow sort of thing. And that's where opinions can come in, but you still have objective reality that is the final arbiter. Two plus two always equals four, regardless of opinion. So that, that's sort of where I'm seeing a little expansion upon what you're doing. Again, some of that may be my autistic take on it and how I've had to adapt to the world. Tag and see yeah. what you think. I actually think that, Nehama, the way you describe the um, different people adding their different colors to a tapestry of like perspectives is more or less how it plays out in the in the practices that I've done. Oh. And so people will have different, so they'll discuss virtues in, in the practice that I had. So maybe like the virtue of integrity, the one day. And so people have different ways of describing what integrity means to them. And each person gets a thing. And so there, there will be diversity. But one thing that's not allowed is to say, I see a problem with the way you described integrity. This is the problem with describing it that way. It leads to this and this um, contradictions or that obscures this and this fact. So you're not allowed to sort of criticize someone else's perspective, but you are allowed to voice your own perspective that's different from theirs. Uh, but I think that not a allowing to point out, um, say, non-ideal aspects of other people's perspectives takes away from the dynamic of a conversation whereas if we if we're sharing perspectives uh, i think even rosenberg said it is fine to evaluate as long as we're separating observations and evaluations so we can observe this is the way i usually use the term this is the way nehama usually uses the term this is the way nodrick usually uses the term and then separate from all right when i when um, nadanian says it when nehama says it when um, nodrick says it it means different things. Those are the observations. Then we can ask evaluation. Um, what is a helpful way to use this term? Like, wh which is the preferred way? What, what are the benefits of using it in this way? What are the cons of using it that way? What's the benefits of using it this way? What's the, uh, the cons of using it that way? And I think that evaluative discussion doesn't happen in the, the exercises I've had. Mm. Um, the, the only part of the evaluation that happens is appreciation which uh, people say, oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Hmm. Which gives it a bit of the flavor of, the, of being a, people stroking each other's egos. Oh, I really like that about what you said. Oh, I really like that about what you, what you said. And I really like that about what you said. To the point of actually in the structure of the exercise we did, there was a step where you were compelled to say, I, what I, I like, of, of all the things you said, I like this, what you said. You have to, you have to like something. And you're, and you're not allowed to dislike anything. Of all the things, I really like the way you sat and talked. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I, I like how you combine uh, how, how my nicely sitting there and talking. You've used lovely vowels in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not going to say I hate what you said, but you used lovely vowels. You've combined all the wonder of sitting there with the joy of speaking words. With the joy of hearing yourself talk. <laughs> I could okay. see I could see why that rule is, but I like I think it's well intentioned, but I don't know how comfortable I would be personally in practice with it. Like, I see I some, this, yeah. I, I did find some uh some benefit at times of doing dialogues, but at the same time, like yeah, yeah, no, I, I see exactly what you're saying, uh, Mr. Plebs. Um yeah, no, I can I see also just, where I went falters. Sir Plebs. Surprise. All I can Nothing. think of, all I can think of, is mining movie reviews for quotes, where it's like you pick out, you know, a, I that was just amazing, and you yeah. leave off 
piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Can we try something? Hmm. So uh, there was like I, I, I was I was talking all week about it to a lot of people. Brace yourself, guys. <laughs> so Lex Friedman invited a sex worker on his YouTube channel. Oh. <laughs> and uh, she was the star, like she has only fans. She's like really expensive escort. On, on, on Lex's podcast, she named Price, how to find her, where to get her and stuff, and what she's offering. So basically, um, <laughs> Lex, Lex provided a platform for that. Huh. And uh, my problem was with, the, like, I think I might have had a lot of problems with that, but it got me agitated. I was thinking about it all week. I found women who agree with me and like, we discussed that. Then I found her actual client, which is like a, 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 like one of my acquaintances. Uh, and then I asked him why he finds her fascinating. So I, got, I started gathering this information. Uh, so far, the only real problem uh, I can voice about it is the fact that he named her a researcher. Because he named her what? A researcher. And he also, in his thumbnail, he called her Ayala, the researcher of something. And she's not Ayala, she's Ayala girl. Like, he has to put the full name, like the full name doesn't sound serious enough. So he had to shorten it to make her look better. Then he, in description, he misrepresented her to make her look better. And like Ayala herself, like when I talk to her client, like she, Ayala is upfront about what she does. She's not ashamed of herself, but it feels like Lex was ashamed of her. My take is I'll address the um, Ayala and her, her chosen path through life. I got no problem with it. She is 100% up front. She owns it. And she's running for the goal. Good for her. You know, again, I understand other people choosing something different and other people having different morals. That's a different story. You know, this is free will and I'm not judging from a moral standpoint. It's not what I would choose. It's not what I would recommend. But if it's what she's chosen and it's working for her, keep it up. Now, as far as Lex and the way he built her, I'm going to sit there and, and say, where is that firm metric to decide honest from dishonest? Because I'm sitting there and looking at it where he shaded and spun, but he didn't go all the way to lying and dishonesty. And part of that is he's a product himself. And he has an audience that he's trying to market to and cater to. So he needs to adjust his package to fit his market. And he had to adjust her sex worker package more to his market. And, you know, some of that leads to less than ideal candidness. I had a I'm going to leave that in peg. Go, well, go ahead. When you said he had to adjust his package, was that unintended? <laughs> um, it could be. Actually, it wasn't at the time, but um, that was much more of a Freudian <laughs> slip in that case. <laughs> Good catch, Agent. Now, <laughs> Nehama uh, had the, the, the second response. Hmm. I'm not sure. I, I don't have much to say because I didn't see the podcast. I don't want to talk about what I don't know. Um, I definitely agree with Graham on on the free will thing, everybody having their own standards. And um, yeah, um, as far as Lex, like my first thought with that would be is that like if um, if Lex felt like he had to change it, then maybe she wasn't the right person for his audience. Like if you, you know, like if you have to change something about your guest, maybe that's not the appropriate guest. But again, I haven't watched it. And who am I to, to criticize Lex who has a fabulous podcast and is way more experienced than I am. So I don't, I don't know. I'm looking at it now. Yeah, it's a sex researcher. 
I don't know if it was in the title. Now the title is Ayala, Sex Work, OnlyFans, Porn, Escorting, Dating, and Human Sexuality. So that's pretty upfront. Do you and remove the, the sex researcher? He put it in the description below. Oh, okay. It's not in the title anymore. Yeah, yeah. If it was there before. Oh. Okay, so I, I guess like, uh, but like the, the point is what like Ayala herself, she like, I, I looked up the meaning of word researcher and it's actually like really specific thing. So to name somebody a researcher, uh, like they have to I, like at least uh, adhere to some of those. Uh, because like to me, according to that standard, he can uh, name BuzzFeed website a research website and it's like purely entertaining they gather they have tests they do not measure their audience they do not know who actually responds to their if it's true or not Mm, so because buzzfeed is not named uh, a research site I, i kind of by that logic i would not call it uh a researcher um so like i think he he just i think he has to have give us to because he is an educator um and like no problem with the guest um uh, obviously seeing how educated i am um i think um precise language need to be used so everything is in the context because i have seen comments like people like I looked it up and I was waiting for, for her credentials and apparently she doesn't have any and she's not a researcher. So let's misled uh, people into looking into I that. wonder if this is a language thing. I wonder if it was a joke. Obviously, there's no way to know without asking Lex, but like people use the word research in porn, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to look that up later for research purposes meaning I'm going to look it up for entertainment porn purposes. That's how people use the word research often. So loosely. So I wonder well, if it was a joke, I, like sex researcher, like if it was tongue in cheek, not actually meaning research, but meaning like in, in the in the colloquial sense that people joke about research, they're talking about porn. Yeah. Building on what Nakama said there, Researcher, I find, is a very low-level, loose thing for anybody that kind of investigates just about anything. For me, the next level up is like scholar, and that's somebody who has a much more dedicated approach, and they have much more of a methodology and more thorough understanding of the field. And then you have academic, and they're basically the credentialed people within uh, within the ivory towers and all. And that's sort of how I separate those sorts of those sorts of words. Hmm. Tag. I I see the word research pretty seriously. Like I would expect, like if you're using it in a serious sense, as in research and not a joke, I would expect to see some research. Um, but but what uh, credentials do you need to be a researcher? Is one of the things I'm wondering. Well, you don't. I I do some research uh, occasionally for work, but um, like my job is not like you know, asking the, the, the credentials don't matter as long as the work gets done. So literally just researching X topic or Y topic for, for a book or whatever. Um, but um, I wonder if it was a joke. Like, I really wonder if it was tongue in cheek and that it just like flew over people's heads because people are coming from different backgrounds mm. um, or if he's just using it really loosely, which I don't know. I don't know. I'm not I'm not totally with you on that, Graham. Like, I think to me, it is a like. I don't think you need to have a credential to be to research and be a researcher. I didn't go to school for research. I went to school for media and communication, but I am doing research. So when I communicate to people that I'm researching, I'm actually literally doing that activity, not just. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm 100 yeah. percent with you. It's just with my autism and the way I, I, I view words and, and use words, I use it via objective things that I can see in definitions and such. Mm. And that's where it's sort of metrics where I can parse into one category or another kind of thing. Mm. And that's why I said with my, my, for me, researcher is very loose in the, how do I exclude somebody from that category? And what do I need to, you know, what criteria can I observe to include them? And I'm 100% with you. I do a lot of research and I research all sorts of things. 
but I'm not credentialed, I'm far from credentialed in almost any of the things I actually research. My official degree is economics, and I don't do a lot with that directly, but it ties into the stuff I view. So that, that's where I'm coming from, is trying to fit what you're saying. And I support your, your position and your view on things. I'm just trying to adapt it to, to, to how I view the world. Mm. So I haven't, I haven't watched the um, podcast. I'm not familiar with the lady, whether she does any research or not. Um, but I have had conversations with, uh, with Cara about this. And Cara did say something in some of the other conversations that made sense to me. And I maybe expand just a little bit on what she said. Um, Lex has been very good at getting very interesting, very accomplished guests on and having very interesting conversations with them. Uh And most of the people I've seen would be people that say from the, I'm I'm not a parent, but Kari is a parent. So from the perspective of would I, would I be comfortable, um, my children watching a conversation with this person and perhaps admiring and looking up to this person? But the vast majority of guests that I've seen Lex get on, they're really good. I would consider them good role models for children. They've lived um, impressive lives. And as far as I know, relatively virtuous lives. And I, it makes sense to me that, that some people would feel like that compared to a lot of his guests, um, Ayala is not a person that they would consider a good role model. Mm. And so maybe in terms of judgment for the kind of people Lex, Lex usually gets on that would be a, a very large step down in terms of the quality of guests um, I don't think Lex is doing the podcast trying to platform good role models for children so I, I don't think that was a consideration of his at all uh, but it does make sense to evaluate the quality of, of his guests from that angle like is this someone I would be comfortable my children looking up to as a role model this something about the screen time. I don't see lately a lot of good role models getting screen time. Not all of his guests are equally good. And so I, I don't watch all of his, his stuff. I kind of pick the guests I watch anyway. So I just decided I won't be watching that one because I'm not interested. Um, but what I see him do with a lot of his guests is ask them about the meaning of life. He can ask them big philosophical questions like that. And he talks a lot about wanting to understand human nature and the human experience. And so I'm, I'm curious if from his perspective, um, get, getting someone like that guest would get a perspective that's sufficiently different from his other guests, that he would enrich his own quest to sort of understand the meaning of life and understanding human nature and the human experience uh, from someone who approaches life very differently and who's lived a very different life and who's, uh, has very different experiences. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a good idea. Uh, it's just like it's the labeling that I'm against. People complaining about bad female role models and what what are today's women are like. Yeah, look what that kind of women get in screen time. And then you are like people complaining they're bad mothers or something like that. Give good role model screen time show good family values to younger generation um, um so yeah, that's my point i have to question that cara mm-hmm. why are people getting their values off of the people on the screens why aren't they developing it for themselves by watching you know what happens and again she's you know that sort of life is wonderful for a woman when she's young when she's in her 40s or 50s she's likely to not be doing so well because of the choices early on and that's you know that's part of what free will buys you you know you 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 know grasshopper and ant sort of thing so that's why i'm wondering why you know and the other one is role models they don't make for good television sitting there and watching somebody just pay their bills it's not entertaining watching somebody take off their a woman a, a very pretty woman take off their clothes that's a lot more entertaining so i'm going to kick it to you to see what you guys think uh, in proper context graham uh, there are channels for that 
so but you have to know this is the channel this is the way this is the road to watch that it's okay but like you have to understand but i'm i'm talking about uh the uh recontextualizing it like elevating it let's say to the norm that's what i'm talking about i'm not talking about like uh, sex was uh and nudity and all of that was a long time ago it's always popular of course it's it's great television but it's showing in that context right now uh it's uh let's say it's elevated to the respectable field that's what i'm talking about it's 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 there on the level you can be a researcher for mit or you could be a sex researcher on only fans i see just the trend where it's going right now which direction which is direction is going? i agree a hundred percent cara one of the th aspects that i'm observing and again this is my economics my actual degree mm -hmm. is you're looking at the confluence and the contradictory pulls of either um basically the the competition of the workplace and the well the dollar versus morality and what's right and those are sort of two different levels in competing concerns what do you think about that yeah, I, I think if it's uh, if it's showing at the level of this is normal, this is how it is. That's where our society develops to. Um, it it kind of I think it pushes um, borders of morality a lot. Uh, it starts with the television. It starts with the screen time, but it 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 goes into society later on this is what's normal i am um i don't know i'm i'm trying to find ways like what's what's next uh, sesame street I like um i was gonna say I, I agree with everything you're saying here cara a lot of this again what's been normalized in society is being prettier having more money, having better stuff, doing fancier things is the best way to go about it. So what you need to do to get that outcome is what society is going to endorse. And again, the fast way, you know, for, you know, and that's what we're seeing there is the, the effect of doing that. That's how I'm reading it. Am I reading it wrong here? Is that just my autism just pointing me in the wrong direction? Uh, no, you're observing it, where it's going. I I am more or less on a position. How do we shape it? How do we shape it? Like, what if from the individual level? How do we shape it? Do we have to go and like, oh, don't don't watch the the, the web? It's all trash. They're like, that's what normal parents should do. How do we shape? Uh, future of the screen time so that our society is not completely demoralized where where uh, human connection is an, like something that doesn't exist i'm trying to promote love human connection and understanding i'm trying to uh, learn about new ways of of connecting to people and yet um uh, I, I don't know if it will ever kind of have place in the society, if it will ever influence. I, I, do not, I don't want a future of humankind to be, oh, people fight for more beauty, for more things. I'm opposing all of that. I, well, reality no fakeness human connection experiences not things no forget things experiences if you want to uh don't don't try to save money for an iphone save money to go and uh visit sri lanka and see new things experiences over things that's what i mean all right we are so on the same page we're in the middle between both sides. We're on the Hegelian dialectic and they're in the uh, thesis and antithesis. 
part of where I'm at though is there's nothing wrong with having an iPhone. The same thing. Yeah. What? The Hegelian dialectic thesis antithesis isn't that the same thing? Well, what? Oh, sorry. She, what, she and I are on the synthesis. Oh, okay. Yeah. My bad. No, no. What I was saying <laughs> is where I'm looking at it is one of the Hegel's problems. Hegel's a muppet, by the with... way. <laughs> I like that one. I was gonna say I have a lot of fun reading through the New Hegelians. They're they're, they're a lot of fun in all the different directions they split off of him. Um, again, not my degree, but something I've researched. <laughs> <laughs> not my degree, but someone I talked to on the internet. They're an authority. <laughs> I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express like that. <laughs> no, no. Where I'm going with Kara is there's nothing wrong with having that iPhone. Where society has kind of gone over the cliff is the, you need to have this year's iPhone the day it comes out. And if you don't, there's something wrong for you and you should feel inferior. That's part of the problem that we're facing here. It's that, and again, the advertising, the, it's more the, in my opinion, it's much more the advertising that's toxic than it is something like Lex's podcast there. You know, it's, again, I don't watch the news at all. I've tried to avoid it for the last three years. But, you know, I don't, I don't favor on YouTube, so I see the ads there, and it's like Grammarly. And it's like the ads of, why do college students use it for their essays? Aren't they supposed to be learning to write in college? And it's just, <laughs> and that... And so much of it is based off of fear that if you don't lose it, you're going to be a failure. And just it's all the ads are emotional and some of that, again, my economics and I just understand how sales work. So, again, I, I, I'm vetching about the same stuff Kara is. <laughs> just from a different standpoint. I think consumerism is a big problem as well. Well, I was going to say, getting back to what you're, you're focusing on, Kara, mm -hmm. you need to incorporate free will. You need to recognize that people have a choice not to do the right thing. Uh, yeah, I and, get it. But how do you deal with those people who refuse? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with those narcissistic abusers? Because you know enough about my story about how that is. How do you deal with those people who are going to pretend to be decent, who are going to use all the tools of nonviolent communication only to exploit you instead? Well, the one thing, you know, like yeah. on the media thing, sorry, I, I'm interrupting and I apologize. No, 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 go ahead, Agent. Go ahead. I want to interrupt, Perfect. so maybe I shouldn't apologize, but that's the Canadian thing. We apologize whether we mean it or not. <laughs> so, like, um, I was thinking, like, when Kara was talking about the, the media and how it's affecting, like, it almost seems to be like there's this like mimetic encouragement of narcissism or something, right? Like this, 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 it's, it's like a combination of mimetic and mimetics and like, uh, I don't know, classical conditioning or something. We're encouraging people to become narcissists, like the, the for likes or whatever. Well, it's one of those where that's with what I've been through, it took me a long time to distinguish between narcissism and selfishness. And selfishness is one of, you need to, everybody has a self. So you have to, you know, you have to eat. So all of those things aren't selfish. And what narcissism comes in is in like a relationship, you have, you know, as I say it, it's me and you become we, and the we's the relationship. And it's a separate being that we both feed into and we take out of. What happens is the narcissist simply uses that as a human resource where they're giving in as little as possible and extracting as much, or as I phrase it, they put me before we in the relationship. I'll tag out to see what you people think. I, I want to say free will is good. It's okay, it's fine. It's just like uh, free will uh, and role models and screen time and tweaking of the social dynamic uh, it's like free will is influenced a lot by what's going on in the media. Free will is influenced by, by role models. That's what I'm trying to say. Free will is not so free when it's manipulated. 
And uh, agent is absolutely right. Current society promotes narcissism, Graham. It promotes it. It doesn't promote understanding and interpersonal connection. It doesn't. It no, I agree. That's the whole, yeah. that's the whole yeah. basis of the doggy dog competitive world out there. The I got mine, you go get yours. Oh, I stepped on your toes. Sucks to be you. I sent you my narcissistic creed poem. <laughs> that's yeah, I get it. But I would like to find ways and solution to change that. Agent, thank you. Uh, okay. Agent has a secret radio uh, 69. YouTube channel. Yes, secret radio Agent 69. 69. Because the year 69, don't get any like weird ideas. Unless you're dyslexic, in which case it could be 99 or 66. Right? Uh, get all the weird ideas. I have. I will provide the link below. <laughs> Gram Punk as well has a YouTube channel. And I hope soon will be a book. Gram, I will provide the links below. And Nardalian is a musician. I will... Here, here, you're here. And I will provide the links below too. Thank you guys for coming.